Hello there, it's Miss Carlson to talk to you today about Newton's Third Law of Momentum, which is covered in Section 3 of Chapter 12 in our textbook. Make sure you have a notebook, sheet of paper, or a template to take good Cornell notes, and we are going to go ahead and get started talking about Newton's Third Law. Uh, this is usually considered the easiest law to understand, and the premise of it is that forces, or a force, cannot exist alone. For example, if you have this paddle surfer here, he is pushing the water with the paddle, and that is the action force. But there is also a second force, the reaction force, of the water pushing back on the paddle. So, for every action, there is a reaction, therefore, forces exist in pairs. So, Newton actually phrased this as, whenever one object exerts a force, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force. This can result in motion, and many times it does, although there are times where uh, there will not be motion. Now, it's important to remember that just because we have forces in equal and opposite directions, it does not mean that they cancel uh, because forces act on different objects. Now, let's go on to momentum. And this is the product of an object's mass times its velocity. Consider the large truck and then the pickup truck. Assume both of them are going at the same rate of speed. Which has more momentum? I'll give you a second to think about it. I will add that this one has more mass than this truck, correct? So if they were going at the same speed, in other words, velocity, right, that's not a factor. But if one has more mass than the other, that is going to become a factor in this problem, and you should choose the larger truck would have more momentum. And if it collided with something, it would obviously do more damage than the pickup truck would. So, The formula for momentum is mass times velocity, in other words, written as P equals M times V, so P is a variable for momentum, and the units we use to measure mass are kilograms, and velocity is meters per second, put those two together, and the units for momentum are kilograms times meters per second. Now, you might be wondering why P to designate for momentum. Well, impetus is a quality of an object to move independent of a force, and that was Newton's term. Now, the Latin version of that word is petir, so there's, that's where the P comes from. And so, we use that also so it's not confused with M for mass. There you go. All right. Now, it's important to remember, and I talked to you guys about this the other day, that um, the equation for momentum is directly proportional with mass and velocity, meaning that if we double our mass, we're going to double our momentum. If we double our velocity, we're going to double our momentum. Um, if we half either one of them, then momentum could be cut in half. So, um, directly proportional effects are seen with this equation if we manipulate the mass and or the velocity. All right, there is a law of conservation of momentum that states if no net force acts on a system, then the total momentum of that system will not change. If the system is closed, meaning there are no outside forces acting on it, then the loss of one is going to equal the gain of others, like in the game of pool. So before the collision, you have the momentum of the first ball, which they're just designating here with the equation. We don't need to really give you any specifics. But the second ball is at rest, so its momentum is zero if the ball is at rest. The collision transfers momentum from the first ball to the second ball after the collision. So if, the fir if this ball's momentum was zero, the second ball, then now the first ball is going or zero or has no momentum, and the second ball is going at uh, the speed that the first ball was and therefore has the same momentum that that first ball did before they collided. And that is because this is a closed system. There are no other forces acting on uh, the two uh, billiard balls except for the balls themselves. 
Okay, so I have a practice problem for you, and on your Cornell notes, I want you to go ahead and number one through three, leave yourself a couple of spaces. The scenario says a class study, the speed of momentum of a 0.25 kilogram ball dropped from a bridge. So you're gonna need to remember this scenario or envision this scenario when you answer your questions. This graph over here shows the momentum of the ball on the dependent variable from the time it was dropped until the time it hit the river flowing below the bridge. So, in number one, applying concepts, you need to use the graph to determine what time the ball had no momentum and describe it in the scenario uh, where it's at. Two, using the graph, you're going to say what time the ball had the greatest momentum and what was the peak momentum value. So when we say at what time in the scenario, what was going on when it hit the greatest momentum, here we want an exact value for the second part of the question. And then calculating, you're going to have to use the equation and the data from the graph to plug in the numbers and solve for the ball's speed or velocity um, at 1.25 seconds, which is right about here. All right, so that's your first challenge, and you should put that directly into your Cornell notes. Your last challenge, and this is for a ticket, uh, using Newton's third law, explain Newton's cradle, which is the picture you see in front of you right now. And I will go ahead and play the video showing you how Newton's cradle works, and then that will be the end of our notes. Right, hopefully you accept your challenge and do the best you can. Mm -hmm.